The Earth is a natural survivor, but it faces its toughest challenge yet. The most intelligent, dominant life form ever seen. Humankind. What effects are humans having on the Earth? Through Earth's lifetime, it has gone through many geological changes, both long-term and short-term. There have been periods of ice house, where there have been polar ice caps, and periods of greenhouse, when there have been no ice caps. Since the existence of humans, climate trends have altered dramatically and are now following a hockey stick curve with regards to global mean temperature as shown by quantitative reconstructions based on climate proxies. One of the most important anthropogenic changes to the natural environment was the deforestation of Europe for cropland and for fuel. Further to the deforestation of Europe, human activity has led to the use of land for infrastructure deliberately changing the surface topography, which further affects processes such as sedimentation. On one hand, this increases the downslope delivery of rock and soil, although on the other, the formation of dams stops this process. As population has risen, there are more mouths to feed, which has increased demand for industrialised agriculture. A greater population requires more energy, producing more waste, polluting both the atmosphere and the environment. The rise of plastics since the mid-20th century as a material, and consequently a pollutant, has now been recognised as a stratigraphic indicator of the Anthropocene. Plastic is being buried and moulded into technofossils, which have long-term preservation potential when buried in strata. The next step for mankind is reducing the effect we have had over the past centuries, using cutting-edge research and technological advances to ensure we don't surpass the tipping point in the evolution of the Anthropocene. In the time before instrumental data, it has been very difficult to measure the effect of the human influence on the climate. In this period known as the pre-industrial, the climate changed over the course of thousands of years. Whilst it has been difficult to measure the changing climate, data is known for this period. For example, during the medieval warm period from 900 to 1200 AD, carbon dioxide levels were around 280 parts million. The same goes to the Little Ice Age, which occurred from the 14th century to the 19th century. The medieval warm period, as the name suggests, was a time of warming that occurred, especially in the North Atlantic. Using proxy data from ice cores, tree rings and lake deposits, the temperatures at the time fractionally exceeded those of today. The cause of this warming was most likely due to increased solar activity, decreased volcanic activity and a change in oceanic circulation. The Little Ice Age that happened after was a cooling period with some areas cooling by 1 or 2 degrees. Carbon dioxide levels were the same at this time as in the middle of a warm period, so the cause of this was probably due to decreased solar insulation and increased volcanic activity. The transition to new manufacturing techniques, the increased use of steam power and water power led to the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century. This was a major turning point in history as the development of the steam engine meant that coal took over in being used as a primary fuel and the large scale emission of carbon began. Industry lit up, chemical factories, cement, textiles, modern industries as we know them, introduced and they all took the world by storm. This came at a cost, with atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide increasing by over 40% since pre-industrial times, from 280 parts per million in the 18th century to 396 parts per million in 2013. At the Mauna Loa testing site, the monthly average concentrations have exceeded 400 parts million for the first time in history. Global carbon output at the start of the 20th century was around 1,000 million tonnes, but over the course of the century, this figure has risen to around 9,000 million. 50% of greenhouse gases that are emitted are generated by electricity production and agriculture combined. The use of gas, oil and coal as fuels have, has been dramatically increasing, causing carbon dioxide and methane to be more abundant in the Earth's atmosphere. Anthropological climate change is characterised by the interlinking nature of the climate system. A single type of human forcing in the climate can trigger any number of responses in the Earth's system, which themselves can cascade down and merge with patterns that naturally cycle. When considering climate change, it is a common misconception that if we were to stop polluting the Earth tomorrow, then the Earth would return to normal in a number of years. However, this is not true. In fact, climate change because of CO2 will be irreversible for 1,000 years after emissions stop. And the temperature change of the atmosphere would take thousands more to return to normal. 
This will result in dust bowls to develop as seasonal rainfall in dry areas is reduced and sea levels to rise dramatically. Professor Jan Zalashevich of the University of Leicester has taken a special interest in the development of the Anthropocene. Well, carbon dioxide at 400 ppm um, right now is, is quite striking and almost surreal. It, it, it's extraordinary, you know, the rate of climb is faster than anything. But of course the big question is what effect is that having? Well, it's often a warming effect, we, we know that. And what effect will it have? Um, the tipping point comes if one then reorganises the climate into a different state, mm -hmm. you know, so then after which there will be no easy way back to a Holocene state. Um, and I think the jury is still out on that. Professor Zalashevich also had a clear view on the impact of plastics in the Anthropocene. <laughs> well, a stratigraphic plastic layer is, um, you know, it, it's quite vivid, isn't it, as, as an idea. Um, well, the, the evidence is out there, you know, the, you know simply the, the, the statistics on the amount of plastic produced. You, know, you have it on every beach in the world, you find microplastic, you know, um, pretty well every grab sample of mud from the sea floor you know, sure. will have some bits of The same was true for the next thousand years. Uh, a thousand years um, will be a, a, you know, quite a kind of dramatic Hollywood-esque Ridley Scott-esque, James Cameron-esque, mm -hmm. you know, kind of world, um, because with the business as usual, let's say we burn most of the CO2 and let's say we carry on, you know, deforesting, you know, the, the sixth mm -hmm. extinction will have been and gone, yeah. and there will be a new kind of biosphere, you know, which is probably much less interesting than this one. Um, the world will be a good deal warmer and will have you know, the, you know, the oceanographic current systems and the atmospheric systems will likely have changed and reorganized you know there will be different patterns of desert uh, and so on parts of the world may well be uninhabitable you know, as i'd say the, the, the tropical subtropical areas they will simply be too hot mm. there will be winners in yeah. such a world um, uh, but that probably won't include most people. Technologies are being created that can allow us to reduce the impact of using fuel, fossil fuels on the climate. These are known as carbon capture and storage mechanisms and are used to capture the CO2 released before it is emitted. There are three main methods of CCS. Pre-combustion capture, post-combustion capture and burning oxyfuels. Pre-combustion capture involves gassing the fuels into mostly carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas, and with the addition of steam, this can be used to produce CO2, which is stored, and hydrogen gas, which is burned. However, this reduces the efficiency of the plant, as less gas is powering the turbines. Post-combustion capture involves scrubbing the gas produced with aqueous amine solutions. At relatively low temperatures around 50 degrees centigrade, CO2 is trapped into the aqueous solution. This is then processed by heating it up to 120 degrees, which removes the carbon dioxide, and the cycle is restarted with the recycled aqueous solution. The CO2 released is dried and compressed, and then transported to a storage location. Burning oxyfuels involves burning the fossil fuels, which have to be natural gas and coal for this method, in a mix of flue gases, which are the waste products of burning fossil fuels, and oxygen. The flue replaces the nitrogen, which has to be removed from the fuels before this stage. This results in a flue mixture of carbon dioxide and water vapour, which can be easily separated. All three of these methods have a negative impact on the thermal efficiencies of the plants they are fitted to. However, for gas-fired plants, the most efficient method is post-combustion capture of CO2, and for coal-fired plants, it is oxy-combustion. Once the carbon is captured, it has to be stored. This is done geologically, but requires the gas being stored at a depth greater than one kilometer, where the temperatures and pressures will be above the critical point for carbon dioxide, meaning that it has the density of a fluid, but the volume filling abilities of a gas. The critical factors for carbon dioxide for this to occur, otherwise known as CO2's supercritical point, are a temperature of over 31 degrees Celsius and a pressure of over 73 atmospheres. Both of these are met by storing the CO2 underground at this depth. The Anthropocene has been characterised by growth, social, economic and by population. By 2050, if current greenhouse gas emissions continue as they are today, 
will be at 600 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The rate at which these levels are climbing is unprecedented. Whether it's too late to limit the consequences of our actions, only time will tell.